The advances in fasting research over the past five years have been nothing short of amazing. We're gonna cover the most interesting advances that we've seen with fasting, intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting over the last five years, and also give you some practical ways to implement what we've learned in this high-level research. Now, a lot of this research doesn't always make it to the surface because there's bigger pieces of nutritional content and health content and research that's out there, so I understand, but it's my job to bring it forward so that you can realize it and see what's going on in the world of fasting research. The biggest piece that we've probably noticed is the influence of fasting on our clock genes. Now, if you watch my videos all the time, you've probably heard me talk about this, but this is getting more granular than the surface level stuff I sometimes talk about. There was a study published in BMC Genomics in 2018 that really just catapulted fasting research into a whole different world altogether. What they did is they took a look at over 600 people that were fasting, and they took cultures of their skin and their adipose tissue. And when they looked at these cultures, they found that there were 367 genes that were expressed that were ultimately influenced by the time in which they were fasting. What that means in human terms is that these genes were influenced by the time of day that people were fasting. This doesn't sound like anything that crazy, but it's insanely cool. What it tells us is that the time of day in which we fast influences 367 and probably more genes. Just by the time of day, it'll change. So you might be thinking, okay, well this is in vitro stuff with tissues. Does it really apply to humans directly? Well, since this study, we have seen in human models that 38 of these very genes are directly affected in a live human model when you look at the research. So when you look at a study that was published in Cell Reports, this one ultimately demonstrated that fasting ultimately allows the body to be primed for food to come in. That sounds complicated, but what it means is by taking periods of time that you are fasting, it is allowing the body to get better at anticipating food, therefore making it so that when you do eat, your body responds to it better. That may be the reason why when people fast, their circadian cues become aligned. They sleep better, they respond better to food, their glucose is better, their metabolism is better, and they lose weight. It is fascinating stuff. So what do you do? How do you apply what we've learned with this? Well, with this, what I would recommend is that you try fasting at different periods of the day. So try doing what's called ETRF sometimes. So in this case, try shutting down your eating at like 2 p.m. and fast through the afternoon or evening. And then the next time you fast, fast throughout the morning and eat in the evening. The next time you fast after that, eat in the middle of the day and fast the rest of the time. Cycle your fasting windows so that you get benefits upon different genes each time you fast. The next advance in fasting research may have literally uncovered the key to the metabolic success of people that intermittent fast. And this has to do with brown adipose tissue. Brown adipose tissue is metabolically active fat tissue that dissipates calories as heat. It's metabolically active, increases our metabolism, increases non-shivering thermogenesis, and ultimately has huge metabolic benefits. So this study was published in Cell Reports in 2021, and it was rodent model. Granted, a lot of these advances are done in rodents. That's how we see the new emerging stuff. They put these rats that were obese on an intermittent fasting regimen that was isocaloric. And what they ultimately found is that intermittent fasting improved metabolic function by the increase in brown fat. So the beiging of white fat, so it turned white fat into this metabolically brown fat despite them being obese. So what this tells us is that even though these subjects were obese, they still had metabolic benefits, huge metabolic benefits, and huge changes in brown adipose tissue, even though they were obese. Why is this so important? Because what it tells us is it tells us that it may not just be the weight loss that's driving all these metabolic benefits with fasting. The weight loss might just be a hugely positive side effect, but the metabolic benefits might be rooted in the browning of this fat. When the fat becomes brown, there's more blood flow to it it becomes metabolically active, and it can actually incinerate calories. They also noticed that there is an increase in what's called VEGF, vasoendothelial growth factor, which means that new blood vessels were forming into the fat. When you have new blood vessels forming in the fat, 
you are literally browning the fat because now there is blood flow, now there is more capillary density, and now there is more mitochondria able to incinerate calories and use fuel. So this might be the key to the metabolism effects of fasting. Now you can drive this up even more with things like green tea that have been demonstrated to improve brown fat. Okay, green tea while fasting doesn't break a fast, doesn't spike your insulin, increases in caffeine can actually improve the fat mobilization so it helps you with the fat loss side. But then we also have this huge brown fat benefit. I drink a few teas when I'm fasting, but the ones that I've really been leaning into lately are the ones from Peak Tea. I've talked about them before on my channel. So this is Dr. Jason Fung's tea that he formulated. So he's obviously a huge fasting expert, but the fasting bundle that you can get using that link down below has a few of my favorite. It has the uh, bergamot tea, it has the ginger digestive tea, it has the matcha fasting tea, and it has the cinnamon herbal tea, which is really good to have towards the end of your fast to kind of help prep you to bring the food back in. So that cinnamon herbal tea is great then. I drink the matcha tea just mixed with regular water. I can have it cool, it doesn't have to be hot. It really mixes nice and easy, no clumps, nothing like that. And because the way that it's made with its cold extraction, it really is a nice quality taste, super rich in antioxidants, super rich in the polyphenols that you wanna get from tea, not to mention it's triple toxin screen. So you don't have to be worrying about mold and all kinds of other stuff that you might find in other teas. It's also USDA certified organic, which is very, very important when it comes to tea. Because one of the things that I learned about tea is a lot of times the first time that tea leaves are washed is when you are washing them in your cup of hot water. So that means any pesticides or weird stuff that's on the tea, you might get there. So certified organic is quite important with tea. If you use the link below or go to peaklife.com slash Thomas Fasting Tea, that'll get you a 12% off discount off the entire bundle plus a free gift. So again, that's peaklife.com slash Thomas Fasting Tea for 12% off that entire bundle of the cinnamon, of the bergamot, of the matcha, and the ginger digestive tea. So the next advance in fasting has to do with the cognitive side, specifically with memory and staving off neurodegenerative conditions. So this study was published in Molecular Psychiatry and it took a look at alternate day fasting versus caloric restriction. Alternate day fasting is where you like fast every other day and caloric restriction is where they're just restricting calories at like 10 or 15% continuously. They found after three months of alternate day fasting, there was improved cognition, improved memory, and improved neurogenesis. Literally new neurons, literally new brain cells in the alternate day fasting group compared to the caloric restriction group. The caloric restriction group certainly had improvements. Calorie restriction is not bad, it's a great thing. And fasting gets you there. Fasting gets you caloric restriction, but there's benefits independent of caloric restriction that we're starting to see. In this particular case, there was also an increase in the longevity gene known as Clotho, K-L-O-T-H-O. Now, this gene was only present in the fasting groups, not in the caloric restriction group. Now, there's no denying caloric restriction is good in general for longevity, but fasting may be providing additional benefits independent of just caloric restriction, specifically for longevity. Then of course there's the ketone equation too, but that's older science. We've seen that 2015, 16, 17. I don't wanna spend the time on that. Now the next advance that we've seen in fasting in the last five years is that of what's called network stability. It still has to do with the brain, but it was published in scientific reports in 2019. It's probably one of the most interesting aspects of fasting research that I've seen. Also done in rodent models, but what they did is they put rodents under a 12 hour fast. And they did what is called an fMRI scan, a functional MRI scan, where they kind of looked at their brain in real time. Okay, and then they divided the brain into 52 subregions. And what they found is that communication and actual stability and network communication between these 52 regions was increased significantly in the fasting group. This is also known as a global increase in functional connectivity. So it increased what's called gamma wave oscillation throughout the different regions of the brain. In simple terms, the brain waves were moving better throughout different regions of the brain, ultimately creating more network stability and more communication between the regions of the brain. This sounds like neuroscience BS weird stuff, right? Well, if you don't know what you're looking at, this might literally be the reason why we feel more alert when we're fasting. We all think of it as simple energetics. Oh, calories, fats, glucose, ketones, getting into the brain, basic energy dynamics. But what about 
brainwaves? What about all of this that we know to be true and real that only experts in that field could really articulate and understand? If we have increased brainwave oscillation, gamma wave oscillation, we can have a calmer, more effective brain with regions of the brain that communicate well between one another. Now we move into the longevity piece, and probably the strongest advancement in fasting research was published in 2019. And this was published in the journal Cell Metabolism, was initially done in mice. So this study took a look at mice that were eating one meal a day, single day feeding, okay? And they found that the mice that were eating OMAD ended up living significantly longer, irrespective of their macros and the quality of food. What that tells us is that they could have been eating total garbage and still would have lived longer just by eating one meal a day. Okay, well those are rodents. Does this apply in humans? As a matter of fact, it does. There's a study that was published in the journal Nutrients, took a look at overweight subjects and it had them do two different types of fasting. ETRF, where they ate between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. and then fasted after that. And the other group ate between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So still a 12 hour fast, but not as extreme as the 18 hour ETRF fast. The ETRF group ended up having massive reductions in their mean glucose levels. Doesn't really surprise us. I mean, you're fasting longer, your glucose levels are gonna go down. But they also had an increase in SIRT2 and 1, SIRT1, which is the primary longevity gene, and they had a really significant increase in the autophagy gene, LC3A. Now, sirtuin-1 helps protect us from inflammation. So even if your diet was poor, sirt one might help protect from some of the inflammation that happens there, as well as the reactive oxygen species. Then LC3A is the main driver of autophagy. What's interesting is that this autophagy gene was elevated more so with fasting, especially in ETRF, than just regular caloric restriction as well. We know caloric restriction helps boost autophagy. We know exercise boosts autophagy a lot and probably even more than anything else. But what this is telling us is that fasting does have autophagy benefits independent of just caloric restriction. So all the people that rain on the fasting parade saying, oh, autophagy doesn't matter, autophagy is gonna happen with weight loss, they're not wrong in that sense but autophagy does seem to happen in an independent fashion with fasting, which is very interesting stuff. So how you can get a little bit more and use this research to your advantage? Occasionally extend your fasts and occasionally close your eating window down even sooner. Try closing your eating window down at 12 p.m. and try fasting through the afternoon and the evening and playing into that a little bit more. Also, try doing other things that drive up autophagy. Try doing aerobic exercise during your fast. Try drinking green tea, which can drive up autophagy. Even decaf coffee and regular coffee can drive up autophagy. Turmeric, cinnamon, these things also can drive up autophagy. But at the end of the day, do remember, the biggest driver of autophagy is still gonna be exercise. But exercise plus fasting plus green tea, hmm, that's kinda cool. I'll see you tomorrow.